I mean, this, this is doing great. I love this. <laughs> we should need to do this more often, Kinthea. So, uh, so Cheryl, um, where were we? Well, we were, I wanted to get a, Kinthea brought up the point. She wanted to know about the, about the hours uh, when the UFOs are. Consistently, it, there, it, there's little variances at, at, at different states have some variances, but by and large, 75% of the sightings occur between 5 o'clock in the afternoon and about 11.30 at night, 5.30 in the afternoon and about 11.30 at night, with about um, 80% of that 75% happening between 8.30 and 10.30 at night, okay? And the rest of the 16 hours a day, from like 1 o'clock in the morning through to about 4, 35 o'clock in the afternoon, only represents about 25% of the total sightings on any particular day or, or any particular month or year, okay? Uh, this is pretty consistent. And the only places we have some goofiness with it is some of the smaller states that actually have so so few sightings. We don't have enough data points to to average it out but you if you stand back and look at it you can see that it's pretty much the same pattern uh pretty much flat there's some interesting things that happen between three o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the morning there are some spikes um we used to think that five o'clock in the morning one was people going out and you know getting their car warmed up like in the winter time or something like that or taking the dog out for that first walk going out for uh, a smoke and taking the dog out kind of thing but we discovered if, like if you go to uh, Nevada, we discovered that after midnight, as the numbers were falling off, there was a bump at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and 4 o'clock in the morning. And I showed it to an investigator up there, and she said, oh, that's when the clubs and the shows let out. So we found out that the hourly uh, data was affected by human activity. Um, when I was at the um, Ozarks... Um, uh, UFO conference. Uh, I was showing a chart, and oh, uh, Arkansas had a bump at three o'clock in the morning. And I said, I have no idea what that's about. And I said that to the audience. After the talk, I had about a dozen guys come up to me and said, Hey, we're all chicken farmers. Chicken farming is big here in Arkansas. I said, Okay. And they said, Well, that's when three o'clock in the morning is when we prep our birds to go to market. So we're all outside. And that kind of gave us an understanding of why there was a spike like that. Um, so these hours of darkness and leisure time are the big thing. Now, what happened was, we, as we were coming into 2020, remember the numbers? The numbers for sightings fell off drastically after 2014. They were going down by 30 percent a year. And it bottomed out around 2017, 2018 time frame. It bottomed out. Even Peter Davenport at, with National UFO Reporting Center was doing newspaper articles. What happened to all the sightings? Uh, as a reporter, I was getting letters from fans saying, oh, Space Force must have chased them all away, you know, that type of thing. And I kept trying to tell people there was a natural cycle to this. Okay, it's about, about a six to seven year cycle. Well, remember in the first book, people ask us, why didn't you go back 40 years? So in the second book, um, the, the 2001 to 2020 book, we did go back. We didn't do all the statistics. We just kept magnitude. We went back to 1960 and brought it up to the year 2000. And the whole total sightings that were in the databases for that 40-year period amounted to about 13,150, something like that, Okay. And while that sounds like a big number, it averages out to about somewhere between 250 and maybe 400 a year. 2001, we had like 3,500 sightings. Again, this is the deployment of broadband. So I tell people, I showed people there wasn't a lot to really measure from 1960 to 2000. So that's why we didn't do, do that. Now, here we go with something goofy. Uh, leisure time and hours of darkness. Um, in February of 2020, just before we went into lockdown, uh, George Knapp called me up and said, hey, my phone's ringing off the hook. People are seeing sightings every place. And I had actually taken 2019 off from UFO stuff because I, I had other projects to work on. And by the way, the numbers were in the toilet at the time. So I went out and did a quick 
quick look at National UFO Reporting Center for January and February of 2000 and saw their monthly numbers for those two first two months of 2020. And they were significantly up. So I pulled up one of my old spreadsheets that had all of them since 2001. And it was the best year since 2014, just based on those two numbers, so those two months. So I stuck them into a model we had developed. And it predicted that 2020, if it kept up at that rate, was going to be a banner year. And it ended up turning out to being, uh, 2020 ended up being uh, equivalent to 2012, which is really fantastic. Now, the other thing that happened was people, a lot of my fans called, uh, called Linda and I up and said, hey, uh, if we're all going into lockdown, that would be a perfect laboratory to measure this uh, leisure time thing. And amazingly enough, the leisure time thing was amazing. March and April sightings were through the roof because what did we do during that lockdown? We, we watched streaming TV, we ate too much and drank too much probably. And also a lot of people were out on the decks or out in the backyard. They couldn't go any place. They were taking the dog out and the numbers went through the roof in March and April of 2000. And then they kind of leveled out for the rest of the year. You know what? I was wondering if these guys had the COVID going just to keep everybody inside because they didn't want us seeing what was going on in the skies. Because I think these guys are going, uh, are going to tell us what's going on, whether the governments do or not. And I think by 2022, I think it's not going to be disclosure. I think it's going to be global first contact. And these guys are just going to put on a show in the sky that I don't care who you are, you can't deny it. And everybody's going to see it and they're going to have to wake up. That's the way I'm seeing it. But who knows? Uh, I agree with you, Keith. Uh, that's what I've been saying is that I think that really the one who controls all this is ET. And that until they're ready, you know, um, we can hope and, you know, push. But it's just, it's really, uh, they're the ones with the power and the technology at this point. Yeah. And, you know, if they wanted to really push this topic, they would, you know, and they haven't so far. So there must be some reason that we don't understand. You know, there, I always hear the skeptics say, well, if they really want to make contact with us, why don't they land on the White House lawn? Okay. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of good reasons why they shouldn't. Okay. There's a lot of good reasons why they shouldn't. Yeah. Um, and uh, because there's enough, are anybody who tries to land on the White House lawn that isn't something of our technology or the president's helicopter is going to get shot down. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they have more ordnance on up in the, the, the uh, attic floor of the uh, white house than you can shake a stick at. So uh, it, it's, I don't see that happening, but I, the idea that they might go out here and put on a show if our, our leadership um, doesn't wake up and start being straight with us. I think that's a definite possibility. And talking to the experiencers, I, I even think that's an even bigger possibility that if our government doesn't come clean with us about this stuff, probably because of our ecology, I, I think I think the ET is going to put on a show. And uh, I've often thought that they have like a prime directive like they had in Star Trek and they just didn't want to interfere with our culture. But I think I don't think they can tolerate the idea of a, of a whole planetary society committing suicide because they're too dumb to take care of their world yeah i um i like i said i had encounters not just sightings but two encounters that i'm consciously aware of and one of them both of them took place early hours of the morning actually um one i was walking home at 12 30 or one o'clock in the morning and that was uh, that was an experience, and I'm looking up above the trees, seeing this something above the trees with these lights, colored lights going on. That's the last thing I remember. I'm walking back down the path that we used to take, which was across the street from me, and took us to our junior high school, and I'm headed back in the direction where I was standing on the opposite side of the street, and I'm coming out of some kind of fog, and there's these two little guys. I look to the right, there's one little guy, and look to the left, there's the other little guy. And I bolted and ran down the path and shimmied under a car. 
and then his little feet come up along the side of the car and I can't stay awake. It's like somebody anesthetized me and I never felt that feeling before in my life. And then the second time I had that feeling, I was living out here where I am now, asleep in bed, dead asleep. And the next thing I know, I just opened my eyes. I'm looking off the side of the bed and I see these two little guys and I'm going, you've been working at this too hard. Because that's when I was really starting to investigate this stuff. And I said, okay, well, it's a guy sitting out there. I can reach out and touch him. And I can't move my arms. But then my right arm slowly moves out towards the guy. He grabs my arm. And I'm in that dark period again. I don't remember anything. But I come out of the dark period, and the guy's putting my arm back under the covers. And then that feeling that I had before, I couldn't stay awake, and it just, boom, and I'm out. Next morning, I wake up, and I'm going... Wow, that was a weird dream. And then I said, well, what was he doing with my arm? And I looked at my arm, and here's the deepest, neatest cut I ever saw in my life, diagonally across the vein on my arm. And then I showed it to my wife. I could spread it, look down inside of it. it. Didn't hit the vein. There was no blood, no pain. And my wife goes, how'd you do that? And then I told her the story, and she didn't want to have nothing to do with it. So... <laughs> That's the encounters I've had. And it's probably the first time I ever talked about it on radio to anybody. But we Thank you for coming out of the closet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, um, you know, I've been keeping my mouth quiet for the longest time. As long as I was working for Disney and ABC, I kept my mouth quiet. But I told them in 1988, hey, we got duped. NASA sent out a press release and announced a briefing about Mars at the National Press Club, and everybody went down there, including my camera crew, which should have been sitting out there with me. And I'm going, where's my camera crew? Where's the rest of the media? Then I get home, turn the TV on. Dan Rather says, today, NASA held a briefing about Mars. And I said, wait a minute, there was no cameras here. What am I looking at? And then I found out they sent out that press release. Everybody went out there, including my camera crew, down to the National Press Club and I knew it was an egghead maneuver. So I told the president, vice president, and head of ABC News, Burke, Murphy, and Arledge, Woon Arledge. And I told them, hey, we got duped. And that's when I took that orthographically correct photo that Dr. Carlotto gave me, put it in a copy machine, it came out black and white, and I discovered the Morgan curve by accident. And then Earl Torrin expanded on it, and I was like, that was the clincher. There's no way he could have made this up because I found the majority of the mounds. And the math is just geometry. It's simple geometry. You know, and I'm like, why are they covering this up? Because it leads to a bigger story. The history of this planet is not what we have been taught. Agreed. You know, one of the other things that goes with that, I, I was listening to some other NASA scientists say that uh, when they got a couple of, one of the particular probes up there uh, crawling around on Mars, uh, they were measuring the, the gases in the atmosphere, and they measured a very high level of xeon. And the first thing this one scientist said, he says, "Why, well, God, you know, that, that level of xeon, they got nuked. Mars got nuked. Yep. You only get that kind of level of xeon if, if, if there's been a nuclear reaction, a big, big one. John Brandenburg made, came to the same conclusion. There was something going on, and something nuclear took place up there. And there's there's... They're seals from Samaria. Um, uh, can I can I give you one? Can I give you one? Yeah. You know, um, I I work work in remote viewing a bit, okay, and I've taught five classes over the past twenty years or maybe twenty five years. I'm not sure, but um, every one of my classes, one of the target cards that keeps getting cycled back into the envelopes is visit the alien base on the back side of the moon. Now, these cards are blind to the people who are doing the remote viewing, okay? Mm -hmm. And every single one of those um, classes, uh, so can go. Uh, done work in the protocols and we're the honest there. And basically, you know, I, I in the last 20 years, I've sent about 25, 30 people to the backside of the moon and to this base. And they were very aware of the people that were there doing the remote viewing. So 
uh, when I hear people talk about faces on the moon, I I don't giggle at them. Believe me, because I, I've had people go go there with the remote viewing sessions, and Ingo Swan went there with it. You know. I I think we have the ability to do these things, and it's just starting to blossom, and we're starting to really give it some credibility. But they don't want to do that. They, they want to keep us in this box and not look outside the box. Don't look over the top of the lid because if you do, you may like what you're looking at and you might not pay us any attention anymore. And then we love lost control and that's what they're worried about. But it's time for us to grow up. We've been doing this for how long? We've been playing this dance and we have been lied to again and again and again. And we've had people come and tell us, hey, this is what's going on. You know, Cobble used to drop me off at my car after the show, and we talk about stuff. I said one night, I said, Ted, I think the cigarette companies have a conspiracy going. Keith, do you really think the tobacco industry has a conspiracy going? And I'm like, well, there's people blowing the whistle on these guys, but nobody's listening to them. The peons are blowing the whistle, but when the guy at the top blew the whistle, oh, now it's a story? Why does it take somebody with the power, reputation, and prestige to blow the whistle before you give it credibility when you had all of these people in large numbers telling you this is what's going on behind the scenes? You Keith, didn't let, me give you, you, let me give you a flavor in that same line. People look at our big number, our 160, uh, 67,000 number, okay? And I get the kooks, uh, I always get the remark, well, did you take out the kooks, nuts, and crack pots? Okay. And I quote this line from um, the movie Amadeus about uh, Mozart. You know, the emperor comes to him and tells him he did a wonderful job with his symphony and everything. And all he needed to do was take out some of the notes and it would be perfect. And of course, Mozart's answer is, uh, what notes would you like me to take out? Well, I have the same attitude on this. Um, Dr. Valet said that 80% of the sighting information out there is noise. MUFON investigators felt about 70% was noise. Linda and I used a different criteria, and we came up with that 68 to 70% was noise. So let's take 70% was noise. If you go against our sighting numbers, um, 30% being the possible really good stuff uh, gives us about 50,000. You divide that by 20 years, it gives you something on the order of about 2,500 a year. Now, when you divide that 2,500 a year by 12 months, you end up with a number of 214. Now, people say, well, what's that 214? And it says that every month, and that's for 20 years, that's 240 months over the last 20 years. Every month for 240 months, we've had about 214, 210 uh, sightings that were something special. Now, if all states were equal, they're not, but if all states were equal, you take that 214 divided by 50 states, it comes up to four for every state in the country, or basically one exotic event a week, every week for the last 20 years for all 50 states. So. Even when you throw out 70% of the numbers, something remarkable is going on when you look at the statistics. I love the math. I, I, I love the math because math doesn't lie. What's the one absolute in this world that nobody, I don't care who you are, or what you are, or where you are, can dispute? Is change. Everything changes. And there's very few absolutes in this world. Uh, Carl Sagan said, oh, mathematics is the universal language. And I'm going, no, I don't think so. Mathematics was created by man to quantify the true universal language, with his, which is quantity. Every living thing recognizes quantity. Okay? I can go to any country and start holding fingers up and they know I'm counting up. Or take them down and know I'm counting down. Some countries it's the reverse, but they understand I'm counting. A rat facing a cat, he's going to fight the cat. But if there's two cats, 
He ain't going to say, I see two cats. He says, there's more than me. I'm out of here. <laughs> a, a mother duck with five ducklings. She doesn't say, I see five ducklings. Oh, wait, I see four. One's missing. She knows by quantity that one's missing. Okay. Every living thing recognizes quantity in its own right. And that is the basics of mathematics. And since quantity is an absolute, because even absence of quantity is quantity, that means math is an absolute. The number one is change. 